European fur dealers first saw the skins worn by these African dancers, they thought they were fakes. They didn't believe that black and white hairs could grow in such a closely intermingled pattern on any animal. When they discovered the skins were genuine, a new market was created. Between 1871 and 1891, almost two million were auctioned in London. The skins have always featured prominently in the dances and rituals of some African tribes, especially the Luo and Kikuyu of Kenya. The black and white colobus monkey, the owner of these skins, is starting to become a rarity in some parts of Africa. Now, despite the fact that there is an international ban on trading these skins, hunting still persists in some areas of Africa. Another reason for their gradual demise is an all too common one. The colobus monkeys are losing their treetop habitat as cultivation encroaches on the woodlands they live in. In folklore, the black and white colobus's appearance invited comparisons with human beings. The early Arab traders noted that when the colobus climbed the trees at dawn and dusk, they seemed to be hunched in the semblance of prayer so they called them messengers of the gods. The word colobus is derived from the Greek for mutilated or stunted. Early zoologists thought the first specimens they saw had broken thumbs, or even that their thumbs had been cut off. The thumb is in fact almost missing. It is probably an adaptation to facilitate moving through the treetops. They live largely in the treetops. There they are safe from everything except leopards, crowned hawk eagles, chimpanzees and of course people. When feeding or leaping they use their forelimbs in a looser way than most other old world monkeys. They use longer leaps to escape predators or for faster travel. When they do descend to ground level, they're exceptionally fast movers. In a small acacia woodland on the shores of Lake Naivasha in the Rift Valley of Kenya, smoke rises from the trees. yellow-barked acacias are being felled to make way for a new farming scheme. This part of a big ranch is to be irrigated with lake water and planted with lucerne to feed cattle. In one sense, the acacia wood isn't going entirely to waste, though few ecologists could be expected to agree. These men are charcoal burners. They're slicing the recently felled timber into suitable lengths for the slow burning process which makes Africa's universal domestic fuel. This felling is all part of a carefully planned farming scheme that will ultimately provide food. Elsewhere in Africa, forests are being cut down at a fantastic rate for no other purpose than to make charcoal, often in an entirely wasteful way. The result for the trees is always the same. This is the process by which the living forest is reduced to sacks full of crumbly black fuel.
Cremation of a woodland requires a slow fire. Grass is heaped on the logs and earth and sods piled on top of the dead trees. The brushwood is burned, seen as useless by human judgment. But to the colobus monkeys, the brushwood meant food and shelter. The farmer has a right to make the best use of his land. But in this case, it happened that the only troop of colobus along this part of the lake lived in this particular acacia woodland. Some of the trees died, but the colobus troop survived. The farm owner halted the tree felling and charcoal burning just in time. The colobus owe their survival to the appearance in the forest of a young scientist. Mike Rose studied medicine at Cambridge and taught human anatomy at Nairobi University for four years. From 1975 to 1982, he studied at Yale University. It was in this period that he began his study on the locomotion of both colobus and vervet monkeys. After a year's close study, the colobus troop accepted Mike Rose's presence without trepidation. His principal goal was to shed light on the evolution of the higher primates, old world monkeys, apes and hominids, which include humans. Vervet monkeys share the woodland with the colobus. Mike Rose didn't expect to come up with any easy answers. He was interested in how differences in anatomy were reflected in their varying methods of movement. There were lots of other interesting creatures to watch in the acacia woodland. a scimitar bill probing for insects. Small parties of Hadada ibis. Vero's eagle owl. And a pair of fish eagles. The lake is one of their great breeding grounds. But it was the colobus and the vervet monkeys on which the long study hours were spent. The actual work involved in the study of minute and apparently meaningless observations can't be underestimated. Later, these observations will be fed into a computer and the results analysed. Mike Rose made some original observations about colobus, a species about which comparatively little is known, mainly because of the inaccessibility of the dense forest in which it usually lives. He had a unique opportunity because this particular troop was isolated in a very small, quite open forest. Mike Rose discussed the project with the farm manager and estate owner, both of whom became sympathetic to the monkey's plight. When tracks had to be cut through the woodland for the cattle, the farm manager agreed to do so in a way that would cause least interruption to the routes used by the colobus in their daily feeding activities.
the estate owner, a keen wildlife supporter, agreed to sparing the remaining trees, allowing Mike Rose to finish his study. So the Colobus troop were given a new lease of life. The first aspect of the troop's behaviour to be studied was the routine of its daily life. Dawn over the newly reprieved acacia woodland on the shores of the lake. Colobus are quiet animals, but occasionally, throughout the night and usually at dawn, the males roar. This piece of woodland was barely four hectares in area, but the troop was entirely dependent on it. Lake Naivasha, at just under 2,000 metres above sea level, is the highest in the Great Rift Valley. Nineteen animals in the group, the largest troop of colobus ever recorded. If there was more space available, the group would probably have split into two. The monkeys used four regular sleeping trees. The whole group seemed to prefer sleeping close together. At dawn, male colobus begin a leaping display, showing off their white mantles of fur as a way of communicating over long distances. This early activity generally took place in the sleeping tree. Other colobus sat and let the rays of early sun do the warming up process for them. As well as shelter, an acacia tree provided the colobus here with a large proportion of everything they needed. Saving this small woodland benefited many other lakeside creatures too. Vero's eagle owl, mouse birds feeding on wild figs, and a bird that makes the most characteristic sound of African woodland savanna, the tropical boo-boo. A pair of African fish eagles. A small wood is a complex ecological unit. If it is destroyed, a great many forms of life will be eradicated. As the sun gets higher, more and more members of the troop become active. The amount of sleep needed is related in part to the time their digestive systems take to break down their vegetarian diet. So this defines their activity rhythms. Colobus spend three quarters of their day resting, but soon even the troop will be driven to start looking for food. Colobus belong to a subfamily called leaf eaters. They have stomachs with three or four subcompartments, like those of kangaroos and sloths. It enables them to deal with their seemingly indigestible diet. Beside the native acacias and wild figs, they feed here on jacaranda, kayapple and pepper, all trees introduced to the estate.
there are seldom quarrels within this isolated group. Though they would defend their territory against rival troops, at this site they've no competition. The nearest Colobus neighbours are three kilometres away, in favourable conditions just within calling range. The first hour or two of the day is usually spent in or close to the sleeping tree, with individuals taking a light snack. This is known as low intensity feeding. From time to time, the colobus groom each other, a social activity that plays an important part in strengthening bonds in most primate groups. Then one individual moves off to begin the first real feed of the day. The troop moves together, following each other in ones and twos, using familiar routes through the trees day after day. A couple of hours of solid feeding follow, then a short move. They seldom travel more than 300 metres in a day. After feeding activity, another rest period follows to allow for digestion. This is usually the time when the juveniles and infants indulge in play, an important part of their social development. things get too rough, one colobus makes a gesture of submission. <coughs> Tail pulling is an accepted form of play behaviour among juveniles. Among adults, it has a different meaning. A mature male propositions a passing female by pulling her tail. There's little courtship rivalry in a colobus group any female is accessible to a dominant male. During at least one of the feeding periods into which the day is split, some colobus usually descend to ground level to feed. Here, the attraction is a lava cliff, which contains minerals the colobus need to maintain a balanced diet. It's quite common for animals to use salt licks in this way, the lava probably contains calcium or phosphates, which they chew or lick from its surface. Both clay and lava may also be used to absorb toxins from the leaves they eat. When the juveniles visit the lava cliff, play fighting often breaks out. Towards the end of his study, 
Mike Rose had a rare chance to closely observe an event usually concealed by the density of the trees in which the colobus live. One of the females had given birth. Colobus babies are born completely white with pink hands and face. And hands turn black within three weeks. The full colour change to a black and white coat is completed over six months. The colobus female embraces her baby tightly as she grooms its coat. For the first fortnight, the baby clings to the mother's belly. At six weeks, it begins to eat leaves. Weaning starts at two months. Full independence from the mother occurs a year and a half after birth. A baby colobus is an object of great social interest in the group. Other females crowd around to look and touch. Quite often, another female takes the baby from the mother. Several species of monkey exhibit this behavior known as aunting. The troop's cohesiveness is probably partly due to this sharing of offspring. The mother doesn't appear to take exception though she will take the baby back in a short time. Young females of two to four years often form groups to inspect a new baby. Males show less interest, except to disrupt these largely female gatherings. Mike Rose reported that this particular troop continued to thrive, breaking off into two separate groups in the 1980s. Over the last five years, research has convinced zoologists that these colobus monkeys are maintaining a stable population growth. In order to safeguard their survival, the monkeys need to be efficiently managed, and people need to be made aware of their role to ensure that habitat used by these charming animals is no longer destroyed unless absolutely necessary.